It is a beautiful woody Wednesday on Beat P week for Ohio State. Welcome into Snap Judgments. Snap Peas, maybe, perhaps. Uh, does that fit? Does that this work? is not for Purdue. Oh. I'll make that clear. Yeah. Yeah, take, you don't need that. Take that off. These are Snap Judgments. <laughs> they are brought to you by Byers Auto in a very busy, very informative media session with Ohio State for a Purdue week. Uh, you have four assistant coaches. That's pretty unusual for Ohio State midseason yeah. and before uh, a game. And then you have Kyle McCord, Julian Fleming, JT Tuimolo, Caden Curry, you know, a handful of, of key contributors for Ohio State. So a lot for us to dive into. Uh, before you start, I will just provide the update that I got on Kyle McCord's left ankle. It was heavily taped as he left the practice field tonight. Uh, I asked him about it. It was obviously uh, something that was noticed uh, on Saturday. And he, he said he's all good. Uh, I talked to him a little bit afterwards and just like not affecting me, not thinking about it, not... Not talking about the severity. It is the left ankle. So if you're a right-handed quarterback, that would be the plant foot. I'm not saying that he's not making excuses, and I'm not going to make an excuse for him. I'm just going to point it out. Uh, but he did pick that up in the Notre Dame game. Uh, the off week was critical, you know, for both him and Marvin to get back for that. So we spent a lot of time talking about Marv's ankle. The quarterback was also dealing with one. So it's just another thing I think to put out there when you're evaluating what happened on Saturday uh, for Ohio State in the passing attack. Quarterback also wasn't fully healthy. Yeah, it might explain the lack of drive on some of those downfield throws, right? I, I mean, otherwise, I thought he threw the ball fine, but it was or little, stepping up in the pocket. I mean, it yeah, could have been anything, but yeah, it's 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 something worth keeping in mind. I think as we evaluate the way he's throwing the ball, which I think is is still pretty good, but maybe that Julian Fleming pass it might be a touchdown, maybe right if he's one hundred percent. Emeka Buka update. It doesn't there isn't really one? I yes, guess. asked Brian Hartline and and literally a handful of players were asked about it. He's, as you see, he's not out on the Woody Hayes Athletic Center turf tonight on the Monarch. So he may or may not be. We didn't see him on that on Tuesday. So that's just the anecdotes of being around the program. Uh, I asked Brian Hartline, you know, hypothetically who would go in. I said, well, that's a secret. Uh, it, it sounds like the, that Ohio State is expecting Xavier Johnson to play a bigger role in this game. Kyle McCord was asked directly about Emeka Buka. He said, I don't know. He, he could play or not play. Not up to me. Uh, there's a lot of confidence for Ohio State in any receivers that go in the game. My feeling is the same today, Bill, as it was on Tuesday. Yep. Don't they don't need to risk it? Right. You don't need to risk it. There's two. I mean, this is every game's big, right? We're October in Big Ten football. You got to win every single one of them. But with that Penn State game looming on the horizon, even if Emeka Ibuka was like 80, percent I still think you want to be cautious. Um, same deal. What I think it would have been with Marvin had had they actually had to play a game. After Notre Dame, they were benef the benefactors of a week off. They don't have that luxury this week. So, um, yeah, I, I would say, like, speculation without anybody saying, like, it does not look optimistic, I guess, for him to play against Purdue. But I don't really know if anybody thought he would. Like, the second he got hurt against Maryland, like, that looks not serious, but something short-term that I think could probably keep him out of the game. All know? right, so we'll we'll put the news up front there on Snap Judgments uh, brought to you by Byers Auto. And now Bill can talk about everything he learned from Justin Fry. He was pretty chill, like melt, like not like pounding his fist on the table about like we got to get better or or like you guys are full of it. You don't know what you're talking about. Like acknowledging that they have things they need to work on, but did not seem like super concerned about their ability to fix it. I think in his mind, a lot of it is simple, fundamental stuff. And he talked about going back to basics a little bit this week, which like maybe you don't want to hear at this juncture of the season, but I think most football teams around the midpoint of the year do find a way to like dial back into some of that stuff to make sure you're on your P's and Q's as you hit the back end of the season. That's not exactly what's happening with Ohio State's offensive line. They just like, they need to play better than they've played at least, at least last week. Right. I, I do. I did feel like there was a little bit of a build up to the Notre Dame game. Then they were off and then they came out and it was like, what happened to the build? Like <laughs> it, it was like a step back a little bit, I thought, but um, he's talking a lot about like hand placement and pad level. And Ryan Day was talking about that too. I actually do think that's part of it. It's not the only piece of it. I think there's schematical stuff to get into. Not so much personnel, right? Because uh, Justin Fry reiterated on Wednesday night that these five starters have pulled away from the other guys who you might consider to get some playing time, which I, like, I think is noteworthy. Ryan Day also said that on Tuesday. I think they're saying that to make a point like these are our five. So these five have to get better. And I don't know. I picked up from Justin Fry at least that like they felt like they had a decent or they have had a decent week of practice as, as they've addressed those things. But I honestly don't even know how much of it might show up on Saturday because the real test is coming two weeks from now. So this right. is almost like a 
it's not a tune up because Purdue's defense is not terrible, but um, it's, it's a game. It's a get right game, I think, a little bit. Yeah, and it's one of those maybe no win situations because if they go push around Purdue, well, that's what you're yeah, supposed to do. Right. I, we'll probably still be talking about. Uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say we'll definitely still be talking about whether Ohio State's offensive line can handle P- Penn State's defensive line a week from now. Like that's mm. that's going to be where that game is probably decided. At least when Ohio State is on offense, that that may sound obvious, but that is Penn State's strength, and that has been Ohio State's biggest question mark. I, again, I, I don't I don't know if calling it a weakness is is too strong. Uh, I know that there is certainly when it comes to run blocking, that's probably fair. I, I think it's you have to include the pass protection. Mm. You have to include the play calling and all these other things that go into it. It isn't just one thing. And and Justin Fry and Ryan Day have seen a lot of football. I, I Ryan Day said this on Tuesday. It was like, if he didn't think that they were good enough, he would say so. And I I don't I think that that's true. It may not be. Yeah. It's not like you can change it and go pick somebody else up on the free agent wire. So you're kind not of not yet anyway. Yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> that maybe that day is coming down the road. But like these are the guys you have. And I do think it's instructive that both the evaluations from the head coach and from the position coach said these are clearly the five and that they don't think it is a personnel problem. I, now, whether they are being 100% sincere or not, we may not know without them being injected with some truth serum. But if that is taken at face value and those guys tend to be pretty straight shooters, then I do think it is perhaps more uh, on the coaching staff to find solutions, whether that's schematics or in-game play calling, adjustments, technique in the practice field, whatever it is, to get some of that done more so than the players. Now, that's, that's again, if that is accurate. And I think that the offensive line is taking that challenge. Well, the last person off the practice field was Donovan Jackson tonight. He was working with Mike Salini for an extended period of time, the longest I can recall an offensive lineman being out there. So it, it, they're clearly working at something. Yeah, I mean, they're not. They, I guess the best thing I can say is, like, I don't – because I think there were some people – who were turned off a little bit by what the, like the tenor of Ryan Day on Tuesday, and maybe the assumption that he felt like things were good enough. I, I don't think that's how they're approaching this at, at all, um, especially the offensive line. They are working at it. We'll see what the results of that are. I, I, there was enough like scheme talk slash ownership on the part of Ryan Day, and then more of that from Justin Fry tonight talking about like specifically the stretch play and the wide zone stuff. That I think maybe they might tweak that a little bit now. I don't think that means they're going to go away from it completely. They might change the way they run it, the personnel groups they run it out of. Like Justin Fry said, like all that's on the table. I think they still have to do it because it's such a fundamental part of what they want to do offensively. But there was enough said that I'm at least on alert for potential changes uh, going into this week against Purdue. So like, if you're wondering about that, I, I think it could be a, a game that is instructive about how they want to run the ball moving forward from this point. I thought it was amusing because Brian Hartline was asked uh, in a couple different ways, like, Maybe you should just throw it ten more times a game. Like, would that help set up the running game? And he was like, "You could tell that part of him is like that sounds really awesome. Like, we've got these receivers and <laughs> the passing attack." But uh, the fact that he did think for like half of a second and then say, "I don't think that that fixes the running game," uh, and then he gave a really detailed explanation why that you know they the running game needs reps. They need taking ten away and just putting on the passing attack may put a different strain on that may make Ohio State easier to defend. I, I, that's That part seems difficult to comprehend because I don't think anyone can defend Ohio State's passing attack. But they have a lot of reasons why they continue to keep plugging along with the running game. And and it does go back to what Ryan Day said on Tuesday, that if they are over line on the passing attack, they feel like they become too one-dimensional and potentially easier to stop. And they do not want that. I thought Kyle McCord said something interesting too that it's probably not talked about as we as we like dissect the run game. What's wrong? Why aren't they more efficient? I think part of it is the situations that they're in, and Kyle McCord like sort of owns like I have a part in this. Like I need to be better throwing the football on first down so that we are in more advantageous running situations and we're not running on second and ten, just trying to get four yards so that we're more third and manageable. So like it's not merely running the ball. Just like the running conversation is not merely an offensive line conversation. I think there is a piece that's part of the running backs. There's a piece that's part of the tight ends. There's a piece that's part of the, the play calling and the scheme. Like it's not one thing. Um, and the I guess the totality of the offense comes into play too. Like they, they do go hand in hand and complement each other. I, you can you do one without the other? Like, yeah, you can probably throw the ball effectively if you're Ohio State without a tremendous run game. But I don't know if you can run the ball the way they want to run the ball if you're not better on early downs throwing it, especially in the first half of that game, right? Like, we 
I don't know if they did complete a pass on first down in the first half. I like maybe two drives they did, and the other drives they did they did not. And that's where the drives kind of got off schedule. Sure. Ryan Day likes to run the ball on second and long a lot. I think just to get something. Yep. Um, so Kyle McCord was like, you know, I have to I have to be better in those situations too to help the run game out. So like it's not it's a total effort to try to get this fixed. All right, let's talk about not the run game. What else did you learn? Mm, what else did I learn? Caden Curry wants the football. <laughs> He's yeah. going to chase it down, whether he's on offense or defense. He, he's got to have it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, don't throw the ball to Kenny Curry. As much as I would love to see it, that feels like overthinking. <laughs> overthinking as they try to figure out like short what, yardage. And what, yeah, what have we said? You're getting too creative. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Yeah. Um, the fact that like Caden Curry was out here, um, like Kyle McCord was talking him up. I think like Julian Fleming was asked about him. Like, it does feel to me like there is a role building for Caden Curry on both sides of the ball. Apparently, I think it's more. <laughs> I think it's more important on the defensive side of the ball, just the spark that he can give them. Kyle McCord talked about Caden Curry's relentless motor, and it's interesting to hear that from the perspective of a quarterback. Like he notices that, so you would think opposing quarterbacks notice that, right? And it's just like a little extra thing that I think Ohio State's defense can throw at teams as they try to get a little more disruptive behind the line of scrimmage. I thought they were last week, right? They bothered Talia Tagovailoa. Last week, I think they can do it again this week against Purdue and a offensive line that's going to be working in a, a new starter at right tackle and a quarterback who got sacked six times last week against Iowa. I think there's opportunities there too. So um, it's nice to see it happening on the field, and it's good to hear from people in this building, both on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, that they're noticing the jolt that Caden Curry is giving them. Yeah, if they're thinking about finding three or four extra snaps per game for Caden Curry, I recommend doing it at defensive end. That would be what I would like to see. Yeah. Uh, that seems pretty effective. The the plays that I can't get out of my mind in Buckeye Q, uh, you'll see that on Thursday with Zach Bourne, who's the you know the Lathan Ransom interception with a, a three man pass rush with JT Tyleek Williams. Want to jump in? And and Caden Curry <laughs> on the edge. <laughs> Ryan Day just wants to know what we think of the run game. Come do it. Come ask us a question right now. <laughs> All right, he's he's burning the mid. Burning the midnight owl on uh, oil. Owl? Owl. But that poor owl. <laughs> that's, that's too bad. That's what that sound was. There's outside. dead owls everywhere. It's, that's how you get solutions to fix the running game, apparently. Wow. That was weird. Um, yeah. Still in the facility late on a Wednesday night. Ryan Day working uh, to get that stuff fixed. And he said he wanted to interview us, but then he walked away. So I guess he didn't mean that. Yeah. Um, Maybe next week. Yeah. Anyway, three man rush, no extra blitz pressure, dropping eight. And so Caden Curry, JT Tuomolo are both seeing two blockers and both of them win those matchups. Like, yeah. you know, that's the stuff that has to happen. Um, the guy in that middle, you know, Larry Johnson talked about Tyleek Williams being able to handle 50, 60 snaps per game and even working through that knee injury and some of the process for doing that. Like, there's no way that anybody was projecting this was going to happen in August. Like, they, certainly not after the first practice. And I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. He's one of the biggest surprises and best surprises for Ohio State with the way he's performed and taken on that workload. So, and I, and I, you have to give Larry Johnson, or I will, if I've talked about the rotation, he was asked about playing the starters more and the, the thought process behind him and that adjustment. Like he was really, uh, you know, I think forthright about that, that in the Notre Dame game, you know, they played, he said they had 25 snaps in the first half. Like that's not enough. You need to get to that full workload. And that he was he wanted in the second half to rotate. That's his inclination. That's his approach. That's his philosophy, and it always has been. And he said he asked Jack Sawyer, he asked JT Tuomolo, asked those guys, "Are you still fresh?" And they said yes. And he said, "Thank God I listened," because yeah. JT makes a play on the final drive. Tyreek Williams makes a play on the final drive. Like that is a change for him. So we've talked a lot about Jim Knowles being willing to adjust. Larry Johnson is doing that as well, and you. you you have no choice. You just tip your hat because these guys are finding solutions. You know, we'll see if if Ohio State can do that for the running game. But if you're talking about the defensive line and that stuff, like that's worth pointing out because you, if I'm going to be critical, when it's not going great, you can certainly praise when it's going right. I think there's a really good feel from that that side of the ball from what the staff on what the what the players are able to do, what they understand now, and clearly it's a deeper level of understanding than it was a year ago because they spent a year in this system with Jim Knowles. Um, 
But it's and like I, I felt that from Jim Knowles for a few weeks now. It's good to hear it from the position coaches himself because you see the dividends. But it's paying dividends on the field. Like I think the defensive line. I know there's not a lot of sacks, but they're playing great. I think like they've. I have felt them more in games this year than I think I have probably in like three years, like consistently. And that's what Ohio State needs. And I think it will keep building. I think this is another week for them to continue to like gain a little confidence. And, and that is part of it. Like even if it, you're only getting after a team because they're a little suspect up front, I still think there's a carryover from that. I think that like you go up against a Penn State team that has a better offensive line, you still might be able to pin your ears back and get after a little more because you've just like you felt that now for a couple of games in a row. Yeah. All right. So that opportunity is coming Saturday at noon for Ohio State at Purdue. Uh, the midway point of the season, believe it or not. Uh, but it's here, and they're at the midway point of this week with a Wednesday practice. That is in the books for Ohio State and the Woody Hayes Athletic Center as well. Thanks for joining uh, us for some snappy Jays. They're brought to you by Buyers Auto. If you're looking for a new or used car in Central Ohio, choose Buyers Auto. That is Bill Landis. I'm Austin Ward. Thanks so much for joining us. We will talk to you later.